This is Writing It, the podcast about academics and writing. I'm Rachel Gordon. Here, we aim to make the process of writing and publishing a bit more transparent and a bit less overwhelming. Through conversations with editors and academics at all stages, from full professors to graduate students, independent scholars, and postdocs, we share stories, lessons, and helpful habits from our writing lives. We're really excited to get to speak with Megan Pugh today. Megan is a writer and editor. She is the author of America Dancing, From the Cakewalk to the Moonwalk, published by Yale University Press in 2015. And I remember when this came out, reading a great New York Times review of it, Megan. I think that's why your name was familiar to to me when I found you again. She has also published criticism and poetry in The Believer, Boston Review, Denver Quarterly, New Republic, Oxford American, Village Voice, and other magazines. Uh, She was raised in Memphis and educated at Yale and UC Berkeley, and now lives in Portland, Oregon, where she helps nonfiction writers hone and develop their manuscripts. And her clients have included professors from all over, including Dartmouth, Johns Hopkins, University of Maryland, University of Chicago, University of Wisconsin, uh, Vanderbilt, Yale, I think even right here at University of Florida. And we are going to be talking with Megan about her work today as a developmental editor, although that might be a term that I am using, Megan, and I wonder if it's how you describe yourself. That is absolutely how I describe myself. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, we got to speak with one other developmental editor, and I think she mentioned too that developmental editors see their work in a range of ways. And so mm-hmm. I wonder if you could describe to us how you see the the work of a developmental editor. Sure. I mean, I think of developmental editing as um, approaching book manuscripts with an eye on big picture issues. So, you know, overall concept, structure, narrative, argument. And the goal is really to kind of help authors have their manuscripts sort of reach their full potential. And so working with writers on um, kind of shaping, shaping and reshaping manuscripts. So it's an earlier phase than something like line editing or copy editing, where people get kind of closer and closer to sort of sentence level and then, you know, punctuation level, citation level. And I do sometimes do line editing with clients once we've tackled the big picture issues and make sure that we have the structure kind of locked into place. And then that's not going to change anymore. But that's always where I start is with those developmental issues. Great. Can you tell us how you came to this work, since it sounds like you had academic training like many of us professors do? Yeah, I um, I do have academic training. So <laughs> I've been freelancing as a developmental editor, or DE, for I think this is year six for me now. And I came to it after years of writing and teaching writing. Um, so I had earned a PhD in English. Um, I had been teaching college for several years. Um, I published the book that you mentioned. I'd done freelance writing, um, sort of oriented more towards general interest publications because I was really interested in getting ideas across to readers and I cared a lot about craft. So I loved research, writing, teaching, writing, but I never felt terribly committed to becoming an academic myself. And that was pretty clear to me early in graduate school um, that I was lucky to be in this you know, wonderful environment surrounded by smart people who cared about thinking together and producing fascinating scholarship that I loved hearing about. But then, you know, I also would want to uh, sometimes take a red pen to the journal articles that I had been assigned. And I would think, well, there's this fascinating idea in here, but what if, you know, we moved this piece on page three up to the front and then everybody would understand what this is actually about faster. And that told me something, although I didn't know that um, developmental editing existed for some years after that. Um, so A friend of mine who works in publishing told me about it and said that she thought I would be good at it. Um, She sent me uh, Scott Norton's book on developmental editing, which I think is a great text and a very kind gift. And, And she suggested I try it out and she 
I feel very much in her debt. <laughs> um, and um, so I tried it and I really liked it. And I kept going and I quit teaching pretty soon after that. After I think I had one semester where I was still teaching and I was so starting to freelance. I was lucky to have a good network of friends and colleagues who knew me as a writer and a thinker, um, you know, people with whom I had been trading writing already. So they had a sense of the type of reader I was, the type of feedback I could give, the types of things I could identify. So I was able to start building a client base through, you know, those sort of warm connections, which I feel grateful for, in part because I don't know how to (laughs) self-promote. So I never had to learn how to be a visible person on the internet. And a word of mouth, has has worked for me but I think I think that's how yeah that's how I started to to do it and I guess I should say you know part of what helped me part of what made it feel really good was realizing how much I enjoyed being in the role of a support person and so I got to collaborate with really I mean, I still do. I get I get to collaborate with smart, dedicated people. I get to learn about all sorts of subjects. Um, I get to focus on writing, and I get to help um, my clients, you know, bring their ideas forward. I get to root for them. I don't have to be a gatekeeper. I really hated grading. I love that I don't have to do that anymore. Instead, I get to, you know, kind of help push these really fascinating projects forward and hopefully help them find readers. That is the best kind of promotion you were mentioning when it's, you know, your your friends or people who've worked with you who've had you as a reader who are able to tell others what what you did for them. I mean, I was thinking about that recently. I was writing, as I was writing the uh, acknowledgments of my book and realizing, you know, there are these few people who were great readers, even if it was just a chapter, how generous and important that work was, you know, that they did for me, what an act of friendship or collegiality so I'm curious if you heard or if you would guess what it was that that friends felt or said specifically about what you were able to do or your kind of reading and editing skills. I'm not sure, actually. I mean, I, I feel like I tend to be a very sympathetic reader. I think that I mean, sympathetic and analytical at the same time, so that when I'm looking at a text, you know, I'm reading it really closely and analyzing it, but I'm analyzing what's there along with what could be there. Um, And so I'm trying to think about, you know, where, what those other possibilities are, how it might be a better version of itself, um, where else it might go. And I have questions about that too, right? I might have different paths forward in mind that might land in different ways that I want to discuss with writers because they're going to know best, you know, about what it is that they want and they're the experts. But I think I am, I am reading for, this is, I don't know if you know, the, the Silver Jews, the, um, the indie rock band. <laughs> anyway, there's this line I think about sometimes, what is not, but could be if it's the mm. title of it. And song, and I think that's some of what I'm reading for, right? Is that sense of the possibility in the work? But but I can't think of particular lovely compliments. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have ever read them up. <laughs> if I, if I can't. Yeah. You know, I I can imagine that one of the points people might turn to you is when they've written a full manuscript or part of a manuscript, and they're at that point where it just feels either a mess or not sure how to move forward with it. And I'm curious if I were this kind of writer and I was getting in touch with you, and by the way, listeners can can find you at your website, uh, which we will list on this episode description, what, how, how might our relationship, if we decided to get into a, an editor-writer relationship, what might happen next? Would you read the full manuscript? How do you move forward when I email and say, I've got this mostly done, but it feels like it's full of problems and I don't know how to move forward? Yeah, so I'd want to start with a phone call um, to hear more about what problems you're seeing, where you think there might be holes directions you might want to take it, what your publication goals are, you know, are you envisioning this as a monograph? Are you thinking about um, trying to push it onto a university press trade list instead? And any feedback that you've gotten so far uh, that you'd like to share with me, that can be really helpful for me to see. Sometimes I come in 
you know, long before anything's gone out for peer review, but sometimes people bring me in after they get peer reviews. And so it's very useful if those have arrived for me to see what that feedback looks like. I'd want to know what you as a writer think about that feedback. You know, do you agree with it? Which parts do you plan to include and respond to and how? Same thing goes for book workshops. If folks have had those, you know, what is it that's alive and urgent to them that they want help with? Um, And then, you know, it's quite possible that when I start reading, I'll see other things that I'm going to want to uh, raise as well. So then I'll read the full manuscript closely. I usually take about a legal pad full of notes on it and then synthesize those, do some more thinking on my own to write up an external assessment. For book manuscripts, those might be somewhere in the 10 to 15 page range. And I want to start with the biggest picture issues. So I want to make sure that we have a shared vision for the book. So I'll write about what I see it doing, what I think its major contributions are, um, what seem to be the main narrative and argumentative threads, or what they could be, and um, and then start with kind of from the outside in. So, you know, table of contents, or there chapters that we might need to break apart and recombine so that reshuffling, we're reshuffling things. Is there missing context that you may have forgotten as an expert in your field that the rest of us don't know that we need to know to be able to follow what you're saying? Is there a clear narrative arc? You know, how might we build in more of a sense of dynamism, change, tension over the course of the project? And and then kind of winnow in from there to more local chapter level feedback. Um, sometimes I'll suggest new outlines inside of chapters. And sometimes, I guess, I'll start to talk about style, but I usually save that for later. Um, I'll talk about recurring stylistic issues. I definitely want to talk with writers about voice, but I don't want to get too kind of persnickety in an assessment because, you know, we don't want to get bogged down making beautiful sentences when what we really need to do is focus on um, the book level structure. (laughs) We want to get that in place. Yeah, so that's kind of what that looks like. And then there might be a second phase where you might then go back, do revisions on your own, send me the whole thing, a part of it, a section that you're having trouble with, um, that you want more feedback on, and and kind of go from there. But I also come in earlier in projects. Um, So you asked about if there's a full manuscript, and that is what a lot of my work looks like. But I also work with folks much earlier in their process, um, where I'll get you know, a chapter at a time every few months as they're building the book. And then it's kind of a shorter version of what I described. (laughs) So I'm curious about that voice issue you brought up, because I know that's Mm -hmm. something a lot of authors want to develop. And I've seen that in my own writing. There are places where I think I can see the voice and sometimes places where I'm getting very technical or really trying to explain something. And it feels like I've, I've lost some of my voice. But I wonder for you as the editor, how you explain that to an author or try to get more of that out of them? Is it usually the case case that you see it in parts and it it sort of disappears and comes back in? Or what are the voice issues that you're often noticing or trying to help with? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it looks, you know, it looks different, but often um, there are different voices <laughs> over the course of the manuscript. I think that's very normal when you write something as long as a book. So there are going to be places, uh, there might be places where an author uh, has much more confidence and seems at home telling the story of their work, making an argument, telling us why it's important. And then there might be other places where an author's voice gets lost in a sort of morass of citations. <laughs> and that's, I think, something that happens pretty commonly. And for good reason, because academics have to read and understand and synthesize all kinds of ideas. And it's part of what makes for good scholarship. Um, But I think it, you know, it can take time to, um, for some readers to, to kind of figure out the balance between those other voices and their own. Um, I think this is often something you see in first book projects too, where they've often emerged from dissertations that often have a lot of lit review at the beginning. There can be a, a, a kind of hesitation and just confidently taking up space and saying, this is what my book is about. 
this is what I want you to know. So sometimes when I'm working on with people, it's it's a voice issue, but it's also about ma- managing different voices, right? How can you come out and tell us what it is that you want us to know? Don't get bogged down telling us the stuff that's wrong. You know, that's a waste of our space and our attention span. Put that in the footnotes <laughs> to show us, you know, what the debates are. Some of that might might be worth bringing up, but not in a way that drowns out your contribution. And then, you know, there are other issues with voice that can come up too, but I'd say that's one that I see a, a good bit. What are other common issues or hurdles you count, encounter with your academic clients? Abstraction. I think sometimes people need help kind of concretizing abstract claims and, uh, you know, bringing things down to earth with specific examples. I mean, this looks different kind of discipline to discipline, um, but, you know, showing us how the idea works so that we can make sure that we that we can follow it. I think um, signposting and meta language is something that happens in long projects because as a writer, you're thinking about how are you going to put this giant thing together, but then you don't want the structure itself to be the subject of the work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so sometimes some of what I'll do is remind people to pull that out, let the structure work for them, or it may be that we need to restructure things. You know, maybe there's there's a lot of meta language about what's going to happen where in the manuscript because because it's it's not in the right place yet. Um, so we want to find a structure that's going to allow the reader to be carried through without having to think too much about the structure themselves. And what else? I think you know, clarity of actors and actions. You know, who is it that's doing what? What is the setting for the story of the project? Sometimes that means there's some of that context that's missing for non-experts. Sometimes it means kind of sketching out, you know, how things were before things began to change, whatever way the manuscript is tracing. Yeah, I'd say those are some of the the issues that come up. It makes me think of, there's this writerly device I notice a lot of us historians use where we like to start a chapter or a or an article, a journal article with an anecdote, like some little story. I, I think we imagine this is like making the chapter much more relatable and interesting, sometimes even funny. Um, is this something, I mean, do you recommend this to your clients for starting a book or, you know, some some kind of interesting, funny or relatable anecdote or story to begin those can be great. I find the anecdote that helps set the argument into motion. And so so not just something that grabs your attention because it's funny or relatable, mm-hmm. but because it contains inside of it the kernels of as much of what's coming as you can pack in there. And you don't have to, you know, explicate it all at the moment. We could, but it can still, you know, be there so that it can transition us into argument. Um, and then we can, you know, reflect back on your brilliance later as we see how much you really had in there right, right from the beginning. Um, I think there's other ways to start things too, but that those can work beautifully. Good to hear. Um, one of the things I noticed on your website is that you did mention how you like to work with academics or you do work with academics who want their books to bring complex research-driven ideas to a broad public. So what kinds of challenges do these clients have? I'm imagining this is, you know, someone like me, someone like a lot of my friends in academia who were writing about some research that seems like this could actually be interesting and and relevant to non-academic smart folks who want to read an interesting book. How do you let us know we can do that? I mean, I think I have faith in in (laughs) the ability of writing. (laughs) I have faith in good writing and good thinking. That feels like a shorter answer than I think you might be. (laughs) But I do think that that counts for Mm -hmm. something. Mm-hmm. And then working with them to carry it through, right? Making sure that I understand what it is that they're saying, you know, checking my comprehension with theirs um, and and thinking with them about how, how it might come through, you know, and why it is that it matters, what it could mean to different readers, how we can get those meanings across. So that sounds like it could be kind of working out with you or thinking with you about how this this little historical item that we're researching has bigger or wider relevance or the sort of why should I care kind of answer Mm -hmm. for the reader, why this would actually be interesting or helpful for a non-academic to read about. So working out why that is the case sounds like it might be part of what you do. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. What kinds of disciplines or, or subjects have you worked on? I don't know if that's something you can share in sort of not specific language. <laughs> I work with folks in the humanities and social sciences and always qualitative work in social sciences. I'm not a numbers person or a science person, and I feel like I'd be in over my head if I were trying to support people in quantitative projects. So I work with a lot of historians, anthropologists, sociologists, worked with folks in ethnic studies, dance studies, art history, architectural history. I feel like I might be forgetting some, but a nice big range, which I really enjoy. Yeah, that does sound great. You know, for many academics, this writing part, writing books, writing journal articles is pretty solitary activity. Mm -hmm. Do you think for your clients, it becomes a little bit less so, a little more fun? What's the dynamic like for them and for you? I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. You know, I've had a couple people compare developmental editing to midwifery, which... Mm. Loved. Um, but that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I, you know, there's there's probably other other careers you could compare it to too. But I think that writing can be incredibly solitary, and um, that's one of its pleasures in my experience, and also uh, part of what's hard about it, particularly when you're working on a book over many many years. And I think it's normal to have the feeling. I certainly had this feeling as a writer before that you could kind of just work on it forever and it's never going to be done. You could keep perfecting it. Um, you could kind of write in circles and continue to make the same point or set of points in slightly different ways. Any of those moments could be a good reason to seek out an editor, you know, as well as just having professional timelines. You need to get a book published by such and such a point in order to follow the tenure clock and and so that's less of a, that's more of a pragmatic reason than fighting solitude, <laughs> but they, they might coincide, right. you know? And yeah, I think it can, it can be so useful to have another set of eyes on your work. Um, that's certainly been my experience, you know, having writer friends and interlocutors who I know can read me and think with me has just been enormously useful. And, and I think that, you know, that's, that's part of what I want to provide for the writers who I'm working with too. A sense of, you know, having a sounding board, here's somebody who's interested because I, I take projects that I'm excited about. So I really am interested in them. <laughs> and I think that's helpful because when you're alone with something for a long time, um, you can forget that there are readers who, who really are going to care about it. Yeah. We got to speak some about books here, but I wonder, do clients come to you also with articles or other genres of writing? Sometimes. Um, I don't I don't ex I don't take articles or shorter pieces unless I've already worked with somebody on a book. But I do have clients who've been working with for a while and for whom I do edit shorter pieces, journal articles, sometimes op eds, and because I I like working with them <laughs> and it's fun <laughs> to see them, you know, inhabiting these these different forms. Um, I've done a handful of memoirs too. Some of them not by academics. Those have been really fun. Also, I think overlapping approach and skill set, but, you know, sometimes different sets of questions to get to think about, um, which can be fun. Great. There's um, two questions we've been asking all guests. One of them is, if there is something you wish you had known about writing earlier in your career, or I guess for you, this could be something you've noticed, it would have been helpful if, if clients of yours realized earlier in their academic careers about writing. I mean, I think when I was a teacher, when I was still teaching writing, one thing that it felt exciting to realize that I wish I had known sooner was how important just doing any kind of generative writing is. You know, that if you're stuck, that can be a really good time to leave the computer and get out a pen and paper and force yourself to write something that might be adjacent to what you're doing, but that is feels loose enough that um, it might free you up in some way. And there's, you know, many different versions of what that can look like. But I remember kind of realizing how helpful that was for students and seeing that for some of my own clients too, right? I mean, one version of that is it might be easier to write in an email what it is you want to say in a chapter than it is in the chapter itself. It might be easier to talk about it than it is to actually put it down in Microsoft Word. And and I think if, if we're sort of, you know, pattern bound, 
in these ways. We forget that we have those other options and I've certainly forgotten. So I think, I think that's one, one piece of advice. I don't know if that's, you know, the most important thing, but that's something that comes to mind. Yeah. I have found that too, the email and the being able to talk it through to someone. And I guess the talking it through is something that clients might also do. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably both things are things they, they do with you at points in your relationship. Yeah. And then I think, I think that um, sometimes academics forget, you know, and again, there's so many ways that people are writers, <laughs> but, but can forget that they're still telling stories. And I think that's something that I find myself talking about with people a lot, you know, to, to sort of step back and think not just about the idea, but the story. And it's the story of the idea. But I think I think there's a, a, a sense of kind of creativity and authorship that that can allow people to claim for themselves a little bit more than they might feel if they are thinking more about, you know, kind of where they fit in the discipline. And, you know, some of it is that I can't help them as much with where they fit in the discipline because I don't know what books to tell them to read about their field. <laughs> you know, I can tell them, oh, here's a really interesting essay that makes these moves that you might want to think about. But really, I'm not going to assign them reading. I'm going to think about those other texts and try to, you know, use them to think with my clients about what their own text may be. But yeah, I think it's I think it's helpful to find ways for people for people to find ways to know that they're writers. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, even as the writer, I'm thinking it, it writing these books or articles become more interesting to me when I am able to find the story or, you know, I guess I'm just um, agreeing with you that I, I feel like it is stories we are telling. How do you help um, academics, though, find their story if they weren't thinking of it that way? Are you asking them about interesting characters or what stories they see or how do you shift them into that kind of thinking? I mean, it's a question that I'm asking myself as I'm reading, right? What is what is this about? What is it? What is it seems to be what seems to be the big story here? You know, the biggest one. And then also, you know, kind of stories inside of the big one. And and so I'm thinking with folks about, you know, who are the characters of the story? What kind of change uh, do they undergo or make happen? And those aren't necessarily human characters, Right. If 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 I'm working with somebody on a book of intellectual history, what we might be doing is tracing how an idea or set of ideas change over time. So that could involve, you know, lovely small scale stories about individual thinkers um, who are inhabiting time and space in ways that reveal these broader intellectual formations to us. But then the kind of narrative drama is going to come in tracking the idea and its changes over time. You know, for example, not necessarily, but that that might be one way to do it. But I think it, I think it, yeah, it looks different project to project. You know, sometimes it has to do with helping. I mean, thinking about ethnographic work where. There's a, you know, a research story of yeah, events on the ground that the ethnographer has participated in often. And, and so there's questions to navigate about, you know, the character there, right? How much are you going to be in the story? How autoethnographic is this? How much are you sort of observing? You know, so there's a balance there that I might have a lot of questions about. And so and so one of those might have to do with character. I mean, then we get into stuff like persona also, um, which is taking us somewhere different than what you asked about. But yeah, I think character, setting, plot, change over time. I keep making this <laughs> motion with my hand. You just can't see that's that standard picture of the rising action, you kind of go up the little mountain and then tumble back down to a resolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, there are times when, when friends or colleagues have read my writing where they've, they've pointed out to me a character, this character is really interesting. Their story, their mm -hmm. story is catching my attention. And they're, I feel like it's that kind of comment that can let a writer know maybe this is worth bringing out more if there's more to bring out. So maybe your eye is doing some of that, you know, for a writer who didn't realize that this little story on the side maybe has more to work it can do for the whole chapter or book. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, it's really fun to find those moments too, to feel like you're very curious about something you want to hear where you have a sense that there's a lot there and you get to ask about it. And there often is a lot there because the people have done much more research than they can fit. And right. That's their words or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Another question we're asking guests is if there is a writing practice or habit that is working for you or your clients these days, something that might be helpful for our listeners to hear about. I think scheduling time to write is very helpful, having routines and patterns. I think sometimes I have I have clients who have writing accountability groups um, that seem incredibly useful for them, just where they're checking in with um, friends and colleagues to say, you know, my goal was to write 10 pages and I did 12 or I only got five, but I still put in X number of hours and, you know, something to get out of that solitude that you were talking about earlier. And I think also just to, to routinize writing so that it's just something that you're doing as, and not something that is, you know, something that you're worrying about not doing. Right. <laughs> and, yeah. And that's hard when you're balancing a teaching load, service obligations, life itself. And so, I mean, personally, I find that writing happens when it's on the calendar, mm. you know, or and there's a time of day when I'm not going to be by the computer and I'm going to be with a notebook, um, that kind of thing. Yeah, agreed. Well, thank you so much, Megan. Is there anything else you wanted to tell us about your your services or clients' experience or things you've you've found with your academic clients and their writing? Um, sometimes I just like to ask guests at the end if there's you know other little examples or stories that come to mind, highlights of your work that would be helpful for listeners to hear? I mean, I have so many highlights. <laughs> so, so many books that I really am so delighted that I've gotten to work on. But I think, you know, something that tends to feel really good is just getting to watch people grow as writers so that I become obsolete um, when I work with people over a time. And then, you know, there's, there's one client I've been working with for years and there was a new chapter draft that landed on this image that I didn't know about that I hadn't seen in earlier drafts that came from a different moment in the ethnographic work that this writer had turned to and pulled from and I I mean I remember getting bleary eyed when I read it because it was so good you know mm -hmm. and so, so any moment like that where you get to see oh they're you know they're doing it um, and I am not needed here. This is an incredible conclusion. You know, those those moments feel wonderful. I bet. Yeah. I mean, that reminds me of the the therapist idea. I mean, people, I guess, kind of go to the coaches and things like that with, I suppose, the hope that maybe the whole point of this is is so that maybe the the person, the helper, will become obsolete at some point. And it's nice to see that you you kind of enjoy that and actually get to see it with some of your clients where I guess they've developed that much in their writing, um, you know, through your help in this relationship. I hope so. I'm also very happy when I get repeat projects from people too, <laughs> you know, and I get just, oh, what are you doing now? Um, and then let's tackle this set of problems and, you know, tell me more about this. So, yeah. That does sound great to have to be able to do that in with more than one project. For our listeners who might be thinking about this line of work, you know, that you're doing now, uh, anything you would want to suggest for them to to read or think about or consider if they're thinking about developmental editor as a, a, a possible career track? I mean, I think Scott Norton's book is wonderful. I think that, I mean, one thing I'd say is I think academic, having an academic background has helped me do this job in that, I mean, for a lot of reasons, including that, you know, I did my PhD in English. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about and learning about structure, form, <laughs> writing. But I, you know, I don't know that you, I don't think that you need a PhD to be a developmental editor or to necessarily be a good editor of academic writing. I think it helps to be a quick study. I think it helps to know writing, but there's lots of ways that people can can do that. And I think to spend time with books is mm -hmm. <laughs> the same thing to do. That sounds very obvious, but, you know, thinking about how they work learning about how they work, um, being able to imagine your way in and think about how else they might work. But I don't know that I have terribly useful 
um, kind of concrete career advice other than things like, you know, dig into your network to build up a portfolio. You might want to charge well below market rate, being clear with clients that that's what you're doing because you're just starting out and you're excited to work with them and, um, and build this up. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Megan. Thanks for listening to Writing It, the podcast about academics and writing, sponsored by the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Florida. Visit our podcast description to find out how to contact us and send us your questions about academic writing and publishing. Follow us on social media at Writing It Pod and subscribe to us so you never miss an episode.